Hey guys, welcome to Flurn. My name is Aaron Nace. You can find me on Twitter at AKNacer. Welcome to part two of our talk here with international badass product photographer. Uh, you forgot Rockstar esque. Uh, Rockstar esque, <laughs> <laughs> Rob Grimm. You can catch him on Twitter at RGG Photo. Rob is based out of St. Louis originally. Originally in St. Louis, and I've recently opened up a Chicago studio. Build um, your Chicago studio. So you're yeah, be it's right cool. down the street from our, from our new studio. Which is great. We're going to be neighbors. And yeah, I'm really excited about it. It's been great so far. We opened up last summer, and uh, it's a studio just for me. So I bounce back and forth between the, the two cities, and it's really phenomenal so far. Awesome. It's nice. Well, welcome to Chicago. and. It's actually Good welcome back. I lived in Chicago after graduating college. Oh, that's and that's right. where I got my first start in the photography business. With and that's where you with, got into product photography. Um, I, no, actually back then I was working with uh, a couple different people. Uh, Saden Photo Group, which is now long gone. Abby Saden and Ben Altman and a couple other people. <clears throat> and Jack Pernod, is that guy still around? I think Jack is, yeah. yeah I, I think he is too. He was a really good fashion photographer way back when. Um, and I started doing some internships and assisting around the, the, those studios, and that's where I got my foray into the business. It's cool. Welcome back. So it's nice to be back in Chicago. It's home. It's a cool know. city. Um, great city. We're going through your book now. All right, let's do it. A lot of really great images here, and uh, we were just talking about you know the difference between uh, a book versus digital, like bringing yeah. an iPad to show people <clears throat> as opposed to a physical yeah. book. And um, let's just touch on that for <clears throat> just a minute or so before we go ahead and get into it. Sure. What, what do you think the impact is, the difference? Well. One's reflective versus luminous, and that has a very different quality on the eye. iPads are amazing. You know, that backlit LCD screen coming at you, now the retina display, it's just amazing. The colors are so vibrant, and they're luminous, and they're just incredible. And the technology is something that a lot of people are obviously gravitating towards, particularly guys your age. You're very well versed with all things electronic and digital. So for you, it's totally second nature to flip through an iPad, to look at the different galleries, and you can have so many more images in an right. iPad portfolio than you can in a printed book. Printed books take time, they take a lot of money, um, you gotta assemble them, you're pretty much locked into them once you've printed them, so uh, it's, it's much harder to make changes. With an iPad, you can go back and forth very quickly. You can remove something, you can add something, you can make an extensive number of galleries, so the iPad has a lot of great features about it. The book does too. Having a printed book is really interesting. I, we walk into every portfolio showing with both printed and iPad. You do, okay. Oh yeah, abs absolutely. I mean, first of all, when you go into an ad agency, there's usually multiple people that are looking at your book. Right. So unless you go in with a bunch of printed books, you're gonna have an issue. Um, you can go in with a couple of iPads and a printed book, and then people can kind of spread out. And one thing I try to do is I try to sit s with the book, the actual printed book, because that's the time where people are most engaged. As they're going through it, there's something about being physical with it and tactile, where they can touch it and flip the pages and they can feel the paper and they look at the, at the, you know, the reflected image and they're drawn into it and they want to know more stories. They may ask me more about the behind the scenes and about how did this image come to life when they're looking at the printed book than they do when they're looking at the iPad, without question. Really? So yeah, it, it's interesting. Now the iPad is great though. When you have multiple people coming in, they can, you know, two people can look at it, they can go through it, they can hand it to the next yeah. guy, and it's good for that room setting. But this is where I think we still really get to engage with the clients, but prospective clients if they're not clients. Yeah, it's it's real. Yeah, it is. It has that real quality it to it that it's it's not just. It's interesting because the iPad it it is, it is really great to show work, but it's. You know, you go from email to Twitter to your mm -hmm. portfolio, and mm -hmm. this is this is nothing but your portfolio. You know, I was talking to before. You know, it's a mix of different marketing approaches. Same thing here. It, it's good to have the mix of your website, um, a portfolio that lives on an iPad, and a printed, honest to God book that people can flip through. You know, back at, back before digital came about, we had to make you know ten copies of these. And you had to have them all cataloged, know where they were, because an ad agency would call and you'd FedEx it to them. And they'd have it for a week. And somebody else would call and you'd have to FedEx. So you could have books all over the place. Floating or around. Even locally in town, you'd have three or four floating around different ad agencies. Uh, that's expensive. You had to know Hugely where it was. Expensive. Now it's great that it's, you know, it's online. People can get that flavor for you. They can know what your work is like. They can easily and quickly send your website or a portfolio PDF. I use portfolio PDFs all the time. Okay. This book, this exact book, mm -hmm. is in PDF format, and I send it to clients with great regularity. Then when they want this, this can be shipped in. Perfect. So that's kind of like the, 
it gets their appetite a little bit wet and when yeah. they when they bite yeah. you you can send this yeah absolutely on their way this is a this is a good hook the, a good hook <laughs> there we go so a printed portfolio is a good hook yeah and uh yeah it's gorgeous uh if you went with like a somewhat frosted uh like a lexan or yeah this up front. is this is actually from lost luggage um it's one of their the ones that they make that oh, you can right kind on. of buy off the shelf which is good i i did have a completely custom book before um actually the guy who owned this building before me was a book binder and i had him make my portfolios oh, nice. which is how i found this this building in the first place nice um Kind of cool. Yeah, very cool but story. Those those kinds of things are gone now. It's it's much easier to buy them there. And there's so many companies that actually make portfolios. And they do a great specific. job. They do a great job. They can customize it quickly and get it to you where it's not. You know, I, I hate to say I hate to say like a six month process, but I think back then, designing a portfolio, looking at comps, looking at mockups, seeing the first one actually being made, wow. then going through the rest of it, it could be six months before you have a portfolio. Wow, it's a lot of time. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your work can completely change over six months. Yeah, it can. Particularly now. Yeah, now you can anyway. <laughs> Particularly now, yeah. Yeah, good point. All right, um, so let's talk about it. Yeah, and then the printing you do in-house, right? Yeah, we've done this here. You know, the, you cannot undersell Epson technology. The Epson printer, it, digital photography changed this market completely. So did the Epson. When Epson came out, and now, you know, Canon and HP, there are a lot of great printers out, but Epson really changed the game. Before we were looking at sending all of our books out or we were looking at technology called dye sublimation, which I don't even think exists anymore. Really expensive printers in the studio. Now we can print this on a thousand dollar machine. It looks amazing. It's better than offset in some ways. It's just, it, it's amazing ink quality. And you can do full bleeds of why not do it here. It's fantastic. You're not getting paid by Epson to say that, are you? No, I'm not. And it's not just Epson. <laughs> but I've heard I mean, it. No, you know, Canon, does, Canon yep. printers do the same thing. HP, there, there are quite a few different printers that will yep. handle this this pro line and it's incredible every almost every professional photographer i talk to who prints yeah. their own work they all print on epson which yeah I well it, epson did come out with that te technology that changed the game it w so and yeah, there's no question and you can proof in the studio before before we would have to you know send out for kodak proofs or approved proofs that you could send to a client to make sure that it was color matching and that everything right. was right you can actually do that in studio now I, we hardly do proofs anymore every once in a while but when that transition first happened, it was great to be able to make the proofs right in here. the studio. It saved you time. You were able to charge for it. Total game changer. So Epson really, they, they deserve accolade because they changed the game. Good job, Epson. I know you're watching this. <laughs> you better be watching Epson. The president I'm of Epson. <laughs> John Epson. <laughs> That's it's actually just... Philip Epson. But... Oh, Philip Epson. No, well, kidding. congratulations, <laughs> Philip. Um, <laughs> So your book is awesome. I mean, I, I obviously love your photography. I wouldn't be here if I didn't. Um, right. I, I want to, of course, um, I, I want to talk about a lot of these images, but there are a few that I'm going to focus on and we'll, okay. we'll put those on the screen as well. Um, so let's go ahead and start with from the back to the front. How do you, we're going to start with this image. Yeah, that image is probably one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult job I've done in years. That was for a company called Yogurtland, and it's a soft serve ice cream company, very similar to Pinkberry. So the creative on this was to have the idea that everything was swirling, you know, from the sky and kind of plopping into your bowl. Any any ingredient you want, it was all it was all there for your taking. So this was tough because soft serve is soft. <laughs> That's it's, my nickname in high school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was a tough high school time, I bet. Soft serve is never hard, so getting it to cascade and hold in this shape is impossible. And it, it squirted out of a machine, you right. know? so it's not like I could just pony up my camera to the machine and all the lights and get exactly what I wanted and get it to come out in a swirl. So this took a lot of time, and first and foremost, I hired Nir Dar, who is an amazing food stylist. He's known for his ice cream. In fact, if you're going to shoot ice cream, he's the only guy that I would turn to. He's out in New York, and he's a terrific guy. So he and I talked about this in the production stage. How can we execute this? And quite frankly, we didn't know yet. Uh, we had ideas, but we spent a day and a half just testing. Wow. So he came to St. Louis before the shoot, two days ahead. And we tried one thing after the next. You know, all the machines were brought in. And those soft serve machines are huge. Giant, and yeah. They weigh 1,000 pounds. And I think the, guy, the, the delivery guys were going to herniate on the stairs <laughs> as they were trying to lift these things up. Um, but we didn't exactly have the pathway to it. So it was a lot of trial and error. 
And we got to a point where we figured out we basically had to use tubing that we could cut along the slice through, pack with dry ice, very fine dry ice that an assistant food stylist sat and ran through a processor, a, a, a food processor, and just wow. powdered, basically turned to powder. So the tube was packed with that. Near did this magical twirl with the soft serve. It was all placed into a huge cooler of very finely powdered dry ice so it could freeze without damaging the texture. Because the other thing that's a killer about the soft serve, since it's soft, you can't just set it down. Right. You can't put it in a freezer without damaging it. And with the nature of this being swirled, we had to see the front, we had to see the sides of our transitions, and we had to see the inside back. So really, every ele element of this had to be photographed without messing it up. So it was a bear. It's a nightmare. It, it, was, it was a huge challenge. It's not a nightmare. It's a challenge. Okay. And that's what's cool about yeah. it. Because we got to experiment for a day and a half before we were like, bam, we hit it. So we tried four or five different things, and they didn't work. They were based in very solid ideas and, and uh, an experience from, from previous shoots. But it's fun. You know, that's re actually really kind of fun if you can experiment and come up with a new way. So we got it to the point where we figured out how we could freeze these things and then take them out on set and literally remove that tube from this swirl of yogurt and hold it on set and get my captures before it died. And we just did it over and over and over. So uh, what's interesting wow. about this, we've only got two shots that make up the swirls coming down and then another shot for the bowl. So that's done in three shots. Okay. And then all of the, the fruit that was there was all hung on wires, shot individually on a background, and all that was clipped out and brought in individually. So, uh, you know, this thing probably took a week in the computer to, to make it what it is, uh, but we shot everything in different, in different pieces. And this was a major, major trial and error, figure it out, make it work. I'm not sure how we're going to do it, but let's figure it out. And yeah. This is a great project. And it's, the end result is... Awesome. This gets a lot of really, attention, and really everybody nice stops on and goes, man, how did you do how that? How did you do that? First of all, you hire the right people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you test, you scratch your head, you figure it out, you know, you, you go down different avenues until it hits. And, yeah. Uh, it's good. And knowing that it's real, like you actually did it, really makes it sell that much more. Here's the thing. You, I, I think you have to do it that way. It's really important to show the client's product. You could do this with a fake. You could have an acrylic model made. It would be a lot easier. Um, you could light the whole thing, but it's an acrylic model. And at the end of the day, even with retouching, it's still going to have that quality. It would right. be a little too plastic. I mean, here you can see uh, you can see texture in this. You know yeah. that it's it's real. It's not it's not this plasticized thing, uh, and that's really important. And a lot of clients are very conscious about that for legal issues too, because somebody. You know, one of the things that we have to walk a very fine line with is being hyper real. You right. know, we call it truth in advertising where we make, I mean, we want to make something entice you. You've got to want that. You've got to want, to, you've got to want it to the point where we're going to run out and buy it again and again and again. So we're going to make it look as good as possible. Better than it would in your hand. Better than know? in real life. Yeah. But you have to be careful because if people go and they say, well, this doesn't look at all like it did in the ad. I don't, this, they throw it back at right. the, you know. So it's important to use the real product to be able to say legally, no, that is our product. Right. It's not that we put completely fake stuff in, it's all food coloring or whatever. You, you want to use the real stuff as much as humanly possible. And has that changed? I mean, I remember years ago, people say, you know, when they photograph ice cream, it's really mashed potatoes. M mashed potatoes or Crisco with food coloring. Okay. Crisco, powdered sugar, and lots of food coloring. That was a magic combination. But keep in mind, that was back in a day when you had to shoot on film, right? Right. So you couldn't scoop and put it out there and, and grab it. right away. No. It, it would die very quickly. And a lot of time we were using hot lights, not just strobes. So there were a lot of issues that went with it. Now that you're doing digital, there w when digital photography came into being, the shift in food photography happened as well because it went to the more editorial style where it's real food. Uh, it's not overanalyzed, it's not plastic or an acrylic model, it, it's not mashed potatoes. It, sometimes that stuff is still in there. And, okay. and I don't want to fake it and say it's not because like when we shoot cereal, mm -hmm. you know, the bowl is filled with mashed potatoes at the bottom. Then all the little pieces of cereal are put in the mashed potatoes so they stay. Oh, no way. And well, then you pour a little bit of milk over the yeah. top? Or something that looks like milk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yet um, to be named. <laughs> well, yeah, yet to be named. I won't let that secret out yet. But, you know, milk will absorb very quickly into the cereal. Right. And it makes it soggy and it kaputs it. So it's, it's dead. Um, but if you, pour, if you were just to pour milk in a bowl of cereal, stuff would be floating and moving and going all over the place. And it wouldn't necessarily look good. Right. So there is a placement that happens with these things. So, yeah, there's, there's still some smoke and mirrors. Let's not... Uh, and that's yeah. interesting. What, you know, it's um, when we first met. You talked about you know uh, photographing. Let's just flip to a bottle of like uh, Budweiser. I think we've got in here. But like yeah. um, you said, you know, you think all those water droplets on there are, are real. Yeah. Are real? Tell us about these. Uh, yeah, they're not real. Um, this this is done in a very methodical way. You know, to get the light to come through the bottle and have it look refreshing and iced and all that kind of stuff. That just doesn't happen. You don't pull this out of the fridge because it's been really cold and stick it on set and wait a few minutes and it looks like this. This we actually do by hand. All those drops are put on by hand. The ice chips are put on by hand. And it's using special effects stuff. What looks like ice is actually, it's very similar stuff that's in a diaper. If you've ever seen a diaper explode, there are these little tiny beads, these little crystals of clear. And they hold five times their own weight in water. So they puff up. Very interesting. This is what they look like. So I, I literally take a paintbrush. I have a, a tub of this that I mix up, and I'll show you guys this, this stuff later. And I paint it on. I paint it on the edges of the bottle. I paint it where I want it. I'm being very conscious not to have too much of it over the label because I don't want to obstruct the view. It will tend to warp lines and things that are underneath it, so I don't want to cover a client's logo up with, a, with an ice chunk that's going to make it look funky. So all this stuff is placed on there. The droplets uh, is a mix of glycerin and water, or, and sometimes other photographers use different tricks. There's stuff called drop effect, um, and it's sprayed out through a variety of different wow. sprayers to give it that randomized feel. So it's not all the same size droplets. They're different. Um, they're kind of spontaneous. But at the same time, this is planned. So one of the things that I talk about that we do a lot in photography, it's forced spontaneity. We make something look casual. We make it look like it just happened. We make it look like it's going to happen at your house. But there's a lot of planning and forethought that goes into it to make it look like that. Right. So, for spontaneity. That's very cool. I like that term. I, and, you know, just the realization that you hand place these drops is just yeah. it's insane. And this is another area for a photographer where you can set yourself apart. You can hire a food stylist to do this if you want. And there are drink stylists that will go in and they'll style this stuff for you. A lot of photographers, including myself, will style beer bottles themselves. It's part of our style. It's part of who you, yeah. You can identify who took yeah. what photo yeah. based yeah. I on can, how they I can style. tell what bottles some of my competitors did, not by the lighting, but by the style of the, of the spritz and slush that, that's on the bottle. <laughs> the slush style. <laughs> you put that on your business card. No, slush it's, no. Stylist. But I charge for it. There we go. Yeah, it's not on my business card, but I charge for it. So. <laughs> Very, very cool. So one of the secrets. Um, this next image I want to talk about here is uh, this Milagro tequila. Yeah. And uh, there's fire in it. Yep. This bottle is amazing. Is that supposed to be like agave in there? Yeah, it's actually the pina plant. Uh, oh, okay. And it's, it's hand blown into this particular bottle. They're really wow. beautiful bottles. And no two bottles are the same. That's actually something that's kind of interesting about my end of the business and one of the reasons why I like it. Even though a, a Budweiser bottle is made in the same mold one after the next. They're all you know, blown into molds and they're very, very identical mm -hmm. in their appearance. They're not because glass has a property of, of itself. So each bottle will vary a little bit. So you get some different qualities to it and that keeps me interested because there's always a little bit of a challenge that comes out of shooting a bottle. And you can, you can be working on one bottle and switch another beer bottle into that same place and it doesn't exactly look the same. That's really cool. It's because of the glass. Right. So it, ke it keeps you on your toes and keeps you thinking. And like, this is a great example of something that is really interesting in terms of the glass, what's going on with it. It's very complex, lots of facets, lots of ways to catch light, reflect light, throw light, and create problems for you. So uh, this one was a challenge. We wanted to show the Reposado bottle uh, with both fire and water get this reflective quality and have it very, very dark and kind of mystical yet still be luminous yeah. because the product can't die. So this is another example of something that was shot in multiple stages. We shot for the neck and the cap to get that in one capture. We shot for the base label to get that in another capture. Uh, we shot the fire and that's probably, eh, I'm going to say that's three captures. 
three different captures. And then the water is actually shot with the fire. It's a tray okay. that we painted black, um, just put in a, like an eighth of an inch of water and used a little bit of can of air to make the ripple while the fire was going and then capture it. So the reflections of the fire are actually real and they, they are consistent with what's going on with the actual fire itself. Exactly. Wow. So that's, so everything in this piece, I mean, it, you know, we, all, a lot of what we do on Flurn is compositing and, you know, talking about special effects and things like yeah. that. But um, this is a composite, but every piece is real. It is real. I mean, the yeah, fire was photographed. Yeah, the, the water fire was, was photographed. photographed. Um, the f the, and here's a little secret for the fire. That's something that's really dangerous and hard to control. Rubber cement. Rubber cement's very flammable, but it's also very controllable. Oh, no way. So I had this tray. It's a, it's a baker's tray. Watch out what you tell me, because I'm going to be putting rubber cement gonna, on people now. Yeah. <laughs> Don't light anybody on fire, though, man. It's I've dangerous. come close. The stuff is, yeah, it's bad. Um, rubber cement is very flammable. So what we did is uh, had this tray that was spray painted black and put rubber cement on the back of it. The tray was filled with water. Just the back edge had that rubber cement. We'd light it and then hit the water with the can of air. And that's how we wow. would get this. So you just do it again and again. Make sure you have lots of fire extinguishers close right? by. Uh, yeah, you want to be, you want to be <laughs> safe. That's awesome. So it sounds like, I mean... It really does sound like a lot of fun. Oh, it's a ton of fun. This business is a ton of fun. It's a lot of experimentation. It's a lot of problem solving. It's a lot of playing around and figuring stuff out. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, you get to make artwork. You get to use amazing tools, amazing toys, amazing lighting. And kind of, I don't want to use the word play, but you get to play and experiment. And somebody pays you for it. It's kind of a great business it's to be in. Awesome. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. I wouldn't awesome. do anything else. It's awesome. Yeah, it's like, all right, how are we going to put fire behind this bottle? Have it right. have the fire reflect in the bottle, you know, on water, on black, still get details in the label. I mean, it's... And, yeah, and not overpower, not be the focal point. It's exactly. Gotta, it's all got to be complementary. They have to work in unison. And it's getting all these parts figured out, but then getting them to work together and play together in a solid visual image. Yeah, very, very cool. And it, it really does sound like you're kind of like building multiple pieces of a puzzle. And when yeah. it all comes together, it's like, wow, that's, that's what Now, we back did. in the film day, this would be really hard to do. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. This would be really hard to do. Um, you would have to do it in one take. And it would take a long time to craft that. You'd have to have... But it could be done. Yeah, it could be done. But that, that image would probably take... That would be a three-day image. I, I don't doubt that for a second. And it would take a lot of testing, sending film to the lab getting it back, looking at it, figuring out what's wrong, why it's not working, doing it again, doing it again. There'd be a lot of repetition in this. So um, that's where digital is really nice. I like digital. I know. <laughs> Probably because you've never tried film, right? Uh, uh, Chris keeps trying to get me to shoot a roll of film for Flurn, and I'm just like, oh, that's a bad idea. You're going to get a roll back, and it's going to be black, but I'll shoot it. Uh, um, no, it's right of passage. You should know how to do it. it you're right. Fun. I should know how to do it. I'm part of the young, younger generation, but... You're, you're completely right. It, I do feel like there's a lot of things that I miss out by not having shot film. I tend to overshoot, for one. Um, I, I tend to... Yeah, well, you know what? That can happen in film, though, too. I mean, you can... And, and it gets hard to edit. It also gets more expensive when you have roll after roll after right. roll. But I guess we should put this in context, because I feel very privileged that I grew up in an era with film, and I have that knowledge base. But I never did a daguerreotype. And I don't feel that I've missed out right. on the photographic process not having done that. Or I never had you know, a wagon with glass plates in it that a mule was pulling out in the West to create my image. So in that sense, maybe it's not so horrible that you, you use the technology yeah, that was the technology available at the time. That's available. And it's a tool. You know? I mean, we had, we've had this argument for a long time with a lot of people about Photoshop when it came out. Is it cheating? A lot of people are like, no, it's cheating. It's, but it's a tool. It's a tool to help you create what you create period right. you know, so the technology changes the tools change and you know different people use the tools in different ways yeah some people are more successful i mean you can hand me a paintbrush but i'm not going to paint anything that you'd hang in right. your house you know some other people <laughs> <laughs> picasso's out there so um mm. very good point yeah um and everything around us is is just like you said it's all tools and Quite frankly, you know, if you gave me all the tools of your studio, there's no way I would produce these images. So it's, you know, it, it's, that's one of the reasons why I really love sharing knowledge is because I, I think that with that knowledge, people can then go on to use it to create something yeah. good. But 
I don't ever feel like just giving away a, a you know a hint here or there. It's not going to replace no that no experience. It, it's not going to replace experience. And you know quite frankly, even though um, a lot of us use the same thing, so a lot of us use that same stuff to make the ice chips. We don't do it in the same manner. Right. You can talk to assistants who have worked for three or four of photographers that are doing that style of photography, meaning beer, slushed beer, mm -hmm. and you'll find that we all have different approaches. We are comfortable with the things that we know work, uh, and we have our own workflow, and it may differ completely from another studio. But that's, that's good. I mean, that's what sets us it's, all apart. It's right for you. Exactly. You know, and, and I think that's one of the keys, is finding what's right for you. Yeah, and we talked about that in the first part of the interview, is like, be be yourself. If it feels yeah. good to you, if this is how you want to go, then you know, don't try to photograph other people's art. Be, no. be yourself. Right. Um, let's talk about this image because it's just really hard. To, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how you did the lighting and uh, how you brought everything together. First of all, we're working with a very shallow depth of field here, yeah. which I don't see a lot with beverages. I see it a little bit more with food. Um, and That's we'll, actually one of my signatures, though, is, is shallow depth of field. I tend to do that with everything across the board. I mean, there are times where you obviously can't. Right. Or a, something has to be in complete focus. But shallow depth of field has always been one of my hallmarks. All right. Without, without question. This job was tough. Um, this was done for the movie Sex in the City 2. And okay. it was done in conjunction with Sky Vodka, where they had a partnership. And the particular creative was charged with coming up with a unique drink for each of the characters. So the four ladies plus Mr. Biggs, we had five drinks and we were doing them all with people. The human element is really important in both food and beverage photography. It doesn't happen a ton. Like right. the, the image next to it uh, has nobody in it. Exactly. So this has a very different feel. This one was kind of a nightmare job in that I was booked on the project. We had talked about what we were gonna do. I did the pre-lighting for it. I sent JPEGs to the ad agency the night before the shoot with my pre-light, and they loved it. They were really happy with it. Um, a bit of a problem came in during the shoot day because the client had never really signed off. In their mind, they had never really signed off on the creative direction. And once they saw it, they weren't happy with it. So we kind of had to shift gears and come up with a completely different creative direction on the spot. I, when we initially were wow. going to do this, we were only going to have hands. They were very minimal. Um, it was a much more simplistic approach. And now we actually see the, needed to see body parts. So we had, and we were shooting here in St. Louis, we had models, hand models come in from Chicago. So, and we had clients coming in from different parts of the country. So we had a lot of people here with the clock running. We had to completely shift gears. We had to both go out and get wardrobe. And luckily, right next door, there was a little boutique and uh, I was friends with the owner and she let nice. us raid her property. <laughs> we actually took fabric here that I had in the prop room. We made a dress literally on a woman wow. out of fabric that we had here. A lot of shifting gears on the fly. We tried a couple different directions before the client finally signed off and said, okay, this is what you want. Um, I think it was four o'clock in the afternoon before we got our first shot off and we had five shots to do that day. In, one, in the day, yeah. yeah. Wow. So, and that brings a whole nother element in. So creative isn't going where it needs to be. Client's not happy. A um, lot, lot of people on the payroll on this one. People have come in from different parts of the country. A lot of money riding on it. And if it's a total loss, there's a big problem. Right. So we had to shift gears very quickly. We had to do a couple different exploration of, explorations of creative styles before the client hit the one that they liked. Um, then we had to very quickly be able to execute all five of those shots talk with the client, know that there was going to be overtime, because it wasn't, it wasn't our it's issue. Not, you're right, exactly. We had had sign-off. In fact, I did everything that I could. I did a pre-light. I sent the images out. The, the art directors had even responded, love it, can't wait. Everything's going to be great for tomorrow. Everything went in a different direction. So we had to talk to the client and say, okay, there's, a, there's issues here right. in the creative, which means we're going to have some money issues, and then we had to get it done. We knuckled down. We got it done. I think we shot everything by 8 o'clock at night. So we, you know, we were able to compress that day down but it was a lot of trial and error in the early part of the day to get us to the point between four o'clock in the afternoon and eight o'clock at night where we could do all five of those shots in four hours and not get that's out. insane it was insane and that's a lot of pressure and that and that's why i'm saying there's no replacement for experience if i was new in this business at that time i probably would have been barfing in the bathroom <laughs> under that pressure you know right but it was just a matter of okay 
and, and I actually got to the point, the, the client who didn't like this stuff wasn't here. And the art director had been talking to them through the phone. I got to the point where I said, I need to be on the phone call with them. This is really important for me because that, that you know, telephone of going from one person to the right. next, something gets lost in the translation. And it was important for me to calmly say, hey, let, let me be involved in this conversation as well. Let me see if I can come up with some of the solutions to the creative problems. Work our way through it, be experienced, be calm, be rational, be reasonable, and be there to help the client. Because at the end of the day, even though there's a problem that's occurring, it's my problem to fix it and to exactly. be polite about it and be professional about it. And, and that communication is huge. Yeah. A, a lot of people, I think that they're almost afraid to say there's a problem. So they wait yeah. to the very end and it's like, oh, by the way, we, well, I we think, need to charge more because we went over. And I think a lot of human nature fears conflict. You know, people don't want conflict. They're, they're afraid it can escalate very quickly and, and tempers can flare. Really, we're problem solving. There shouldn't be conflict. There should be solutions to problems. Right. And that's what, you know, that's where a good crew around you really comes in handy. The best producers, are the producers who look at the project knowing that something's going to go wrong. Something always, it, there, there's always a curveball. I personally work very well with the producers that come up and say, hey, Rob, um, tell me what you think. We've got this, this, and this that we can do for the problem that I'm not going to tell you about. And other producers will come up to you and say, okay, this is messed up, and it could go badly in this respect or this respect or this respect. What do you want to do to fix it? Very different approach. Very different approach. The second part, the second person is tough to work with because they get everything in a tailspin. The first person that comes to you and says, okay, there's, here are a couple solutions you might want to think about. Here's the problem. What do you want to do? It gives me the decision as the job leader. Right. It gives me the opportunity as a job leader to make a quick decision, say this is what I want to do, and go down that road. That road may be wrong, by the way, but I'm being decisive and right. I'm doing it in a non-combative way to say, okay, let's try this. Let's make it work. If it doesn't, all right, I'm going to shift gears shift and I'm going to figure out another way to make it work. But it's, it's definitely a professional attitude. So being the ability to make a decision quickly and stick with it until you know you need to make it. Not necessarily quickly. You, you do, I think you need to be decisive. Okay. And I, I don't think you can just make a quick, uh, a quick decision. It has to be an informed decision. Right. You need to be able to talk with your client in a way that they know is not combative, that you're trying to help them, that you're looking for answers, you're looking for... Um, them to give you as much information as they possibly can for you to help guide the project in the way that you think it's going to be most successful for them. Right. Because at the end of the day, this project is for them. It's not for you. It may go in your book. You may sit down at a table and, and tell somebody the stories about this image and, and how it came to be, but it's not for you. Right. You, know? you and don't that's own the, you the know, vodka brand. No, I don't own the vodka <laughs> brand. And that's something interesting that you think about. As an artist, you tend to get in this business to make your art. Right. But as a professional artist, you're making your art on somebody else's nickel against a clock for an end result that isn't necessarily yours. You know, so it, that's something to keep in mind, too. Yeah. It's an interesting mindset. I mean, even I'm, I'm thinking of Renaissance painters, you know, like yeah. they, they had clients, you know, they, they were did. painting for the royal family. Right. And if the royal right. family didn't like the paintings, yeah, that's an interesting they're analogy. fired. Yeah. And, you know, or I mean, beheaded, even more. Exactly. So <laughs> it's... It's an age-old, you know, yeah. kind of issue that artists face. It's like, yeah, you're creating great art, but at the end of the day, if someone else is paying for that art, that's yeah. the person who has to be happy. Yeah, and it, it's weird to get your your head around the fact that art is commerce, you know? Very weird. Because a lot of people think of art as art, not art as commerce, but if you're going to make a living at it, it is commerce. It's, right. It's a commercial product that you got to sell. Yeah, you're, the exchange of uh, goods and services is like, this is this is your good. Right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's a good, I, very good. And you're making other people look good as well. So uh, let's just talk about a couple of the other images. This is a really interesting image. The, uh, the Triumph watch here. Yeah. This, this? You know, this is something I, I, I like talking about because this is completely done for my book. Um, I had this watch. I, I, I thought it was really interesting. I bought it to shoot for the portfolio and I probably put it out on set two or three times and I hated everything about it. Didn't work. Tried a couple different approaches. It just didn't, n none of the images were there. So I set it on the shelf and just kind of let it sit. I pulled out, tried it, it wouldn't work. Sometimes that happens, not often, but some, sometimes you just can't get something to click. Right. So one day 
it was a nice summer day. I had a yellow tomato in my lunch. And I literally started pulling out my lunch. And I saw the yellow tomato, which was very orange. I'm like, that's the color of the watch. That's that graphic element that I need. So I pulled the watch out, got it off the shelf, wrapped it, it's just wrapped around a tomato, sat down on the set, lit, bam. That was the clean, simple graphic element I needed. It was what I needed to tie the background in, and it worked. And the reason why I like talking about this, I tried several times to come up with something that all failed, and inspiration came to me in something. Your lunch? Yeah, my lunch. <laughs> I, what? I never would have thought of that in a hundred right. years. It just hit me, and that's one of the great things about being an artist. Sometimes inspiration just hits you. Don't know why, don't know from where, just wait long enough, it'll come. Right. As and long as it's stirring in your mind. You as long given as up you've got it. something going in there. Yeah, and I didn't give up on it. I, I liked this watch. I thought there was something interesting about it. I like shooting watches. This one just hadn't clicked yet, and I needed the right inspiration, and it turned out to be something very simple and kicked in. And that's, it, it's interesting, too, because this was done personally. You know, this is, yeah. this is a personal project, but um, perhaps, you know, doing this, is going to inspire a shoot in the future. Maybe it already has, in which yeah. you shot a different yeah, there's, watch. There's no like, question. And, and if you look at the book, when you go through it, I think it's important to have a mix of personal and uh, client work. It's, uh, it's tough. In the beginning, you kind of have to go in with all personal work because right. you haven't had client stuff. Right. Um, and clients don't want you to come in just with client work. I mean, they want to see what you do, what your vision is, because you can go further when you don't have the parameters of a client right. or not necessarily the client. If you don't have the parameters of a layout, you have to fit in this 11 by 14 crop or you have to fit something that's going to fit on the back of a bus or you know a case card or whatever um, that can have a big hampering effect on what the creativity is if you're just shooting for your portfolio there's kind of no limit and people want to see that so it's really good to have that kind of mix in your book of, of personal and client work that's really good advice and i i know that you know this is you've been shooting for over 20 years and this yeah. is this is not all the images you've ever taken. Oh, God, no. <laughs> right? So, <laughs> no, no, um, no. It's a weeding out. Percentage yeah. of, you know, uh, what, what's that process like for you, you know, in choosing the images that are ultimately going to make the book, um, you know, and how many, this is awesome, this is octopus, how many, um, is there a number that you focus on between 20 and 50 images? 20 or? and 30 okay. is, is a really good number. I, I tend to go more towards the 30. I think what, what is really critical, absolutely critical, is to tell a story, to have a thread, to have something that moves, for, you know, moves people through this. Uh, some people will put only what they want to photograph in a portfolio. And those, in some ways, are the most successful portfolios because it really shows the client what you want to do. And then a lot of people will hire you based on that. A lot of clients really do though, they need to see examples of client work. Right. It's important to, have, you know, to me it's important to have that mix, but without question, you have to have them engaged from the front image to the back image. There has to be a way for their eye to go through this. There has to be a way to stir emotion through them, through the entire thing. And that emotion, keep in mind, can be wanting something. It's not just like, oh man, that guy is unbelievable. Like, look at his face. It can be like, ah, I want to buy that. Oh, I'm thirsty. And I love it going in portfolio shoots and people are like, oh, it's only 11. I'm so hungry. Right. You know, <laughs> that's what I want, it's right? Like, I hate octopus, but I want to eat one right well, now. Well, some people are like, God, that's so gross. I can't stop staring at it. You know? <laughs> right. And that's good. You draw on them in. You grab their attention. You got to grab them. Somehow you got to grab them and suck them in. It's just, it's, it's key. So the pagination, the way you put these images together, I think about this stuff. I mean, I think about what is the very first image, yeah. how it's going to look, and then, you know, what happens on page two and three, and how does, how does page three then translate to page four? You know, what people see here will have an effect on what they see here. Exactly. So it's very well thought out. Um, and I notice just a couple of things, and um, I'm just going to point them out as I kind of see. We've got complementary colors working. Yeah. And I'm guessing that's on purpose. Yeah, sometimes it, it I, I'm not going to say that there's a formula. Okay. Because sometimes it's the emotion that's evoked by the two pieces side by side. Um, sometimes it's pure color palette. You mm -hmm. don't know why two images will necessarily work together. And the way I did this, it, this was a lengthy process. It took a few months, and it happened in conjunction with my new website. So I was trying images left and right and switching things around. I printed everything out really small. Okay. And cut them out and move them around, put things side by side, 
then I wound up, wound up printing them large and doing the same thing, putting them side by side before I printed the final book. Wow. So it was a lot of trial and error in terms of, you know, this image actually worked well with two or three images, but which one was the best for it? Okay. And there's some experimentation that goes with that, and you, and you, do, see, you do see different combinations in it. Um, from, from one, you know, going, going through and looking one time to the next, you can see different combinations, right. and it's a matter of, of really trying to figure out what is the, has the best impact that's going to get you the most clients. Yeah, and that's, that's really interesting because it's, it's not only the individual photos that are the product that you're selling, it's the compilation of all the photos together. That well, you're the selling the whole yeah. book, too. The compilation of all those photos together gives you your style. Right. You know, an image or two here is an image or two. The book as a cohesive unit is your style. That's, that's what that's you're selling. That's the quote of the day right there. All right, good. <laughs> the book, yeah, your work as the, a whole yeah. is your style. That is your style. That makes up your style. One image does not make up your style. You know? That's brilliant. Because I, I think a lot of people out there, you know, in, in year one and two, they're like, what is my style? I got to create my style. And right. I, I think the answer is probably like, look at your work and that already right. is your style. Right. And, and style is also fluid. It changes. Like If you look at my work from the early 90s to now, completely different. Totally different. Oh yeah, totally different. And you know, back in the early 90s too, it was super saturated color. And I, and I had a very distinctive style. I had this um, multi-layered plexiglass set and I would shoot colored lights up from the base through this white plexiglass and I had product floating on clear plexiglass above it. So all the stuff was floating in these fields of color and sometimes it was simple one you know one color other times it was multiple colors that were you know bled together down underneath with light very complex stuff super saturated completely blinks out you know if you were to look at it now it might give you epilepsy <laughs> <laughs> but that was big in the 80s it People was big that stuff. Yeah, it was huge man <laughs> epilepsy we're gonna get that <laughs> What is that drug, right? <laughs> it's crazy. So it's, it's interesting to see how your style does change. And it's a, it's a, it is a very fluid thing. It will change as you grow through the business. There's no question. So I don't know where I'll be in 15 or 20 years, what my style will look like in comparison to this. I would think now it would probably be pretty similar to this. Because right. I've really settled into a groove. I've been in the business for a couple of decades. And I think I've really found my voice. You know, I think, the, I think it's very difficult for a young photographer to find their voice in the first year or two. I think it's really a decade or two process. And once you've, you know, you've built that business and you've been going for a while, you've really found a voice that's, that's yours and it's fairly unique. And that gives you room to explore some other directions. And is your, is your voice a reaction to the, the times? Let's say, you know, the difference between the 80s and 90s and today like the general styles have changed oh what, yeah what absolutely a, a, absolutely and so i think do you that react to those sure okay I, I, you have to like i said you know during the 90s it was really colorful stuff and but still very shallow depth of field um tight cropping i mean you can see a lot of my approach right to that style is the same approach that i have here even though it's much more open and high key and very light and shallow. I, you'll see a lot of similarities, even though the end result is completely different. Uh, but yeah, you have to react to the times, otherwise you will look dated, right? Right. It's, it's interesting though, uh, some image, really successful images will last through some serious years. You don't want to have stuff in your book necessarily that you did 10 years ago, unless it's a really enduring image that still grabs people's attention and it's current and relevant with your, with your material. Um, but yeah, you have to change with the times. Otherwise, you're stagnant and people are going to leave you where they last saw you. Right. Right? Yeah, he's a product of like the you 90s. Do that, yeah, you do that with people in high school. You tend to think of them as the way they were in high school. <laughs> totally. They may have been a total dork and now he's running some major, you know, major company. Is, com. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still perfect, a dork, by the way. Perfect example. <laughs> um, what's the oldest image in this book? Mm, good question. Uh, I, I don't... Or just one that maybe pops out as like, you know what? I shot this a long time ago. Let me lead to a quick look. No worries. Here. I know I kind of popped that one on you, but it, it was a reaction to kind of what we were just talking about there. There isn't a lot in this book that is very old. I don't think there's, there's much stuff in here that's older than four years. Okay. At most. Uh, and that's interesting too because maybe it's funny, I think it's actually this. That that image is probably five or six years old. 
Um, so the latest image in your book is five or six years old, even yeah. though you've been shooting for and 20 this was plus years. And this is probably five years old, too. I did that for, uh, for Starbucks Tazo Tea. Um, so that may be five years old as well. But yeah, I want to keep things current. I want to, you know, and I feel like I, as I've been in the business longer, I get better. Right. I want to show more current work. You want to work. show the current better work. Yeah, without, without question. And that's, yeah, it, it also shows that you're still shooting. You know, if you can come to a <laughs> right. if you can come to a client meeting and you know you've got ten new images in your book and they're like oh, I've never, I haven't seen this yeah. stuff. It, it, they like to know you're busy. Mm -hmm. They like to know what you've been working on lately, and they like to hear that you are um, active with other clients and that you're still relevant. You know, they don't really want to. Uh, oh, he hasn't shot anything in five years. Let, let, let me go spend my ad budget on him. You know? Right. So, yeah, you want to show current work, and it's 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 important. In periods of downtime, because there, there are ups and downs, do mm -hmm. you focus more on personal work during those downtimes? I photograph on creating, I concentrate on photographing more images, yeah. Um, personal work, I, I, I can't say that I do a ton of it. I think that I personally have a lot of commercial and, you know, insight for my images. I'm not, okay. I'm not going off and doing a bunch of work that I then want to wind up in a gallery somewhere. Or, right. uh, I don't have a big focus on creating images that I can have at a gallery opening and have all my friends come and they can talk about how great my artwork is. Um, the images that I tend to create are to get me more commercial work. Now my kids are well documented. Hopefully my grandkids one day are going to be like, wow, look at these pictures of mom that grandpa <laughs> took, you know? So that tends to be a lot of my personal work. Right. Uh, but the images I do during my downtime, we definitely concentrate on making stuff that is that has commercial viability. Okay. That can be saleable, you know? Bottom line, it's got to be saleable. And in in those downtimes, because I, I know they all come, do you, what, what is your process? Do you look out? what's out there currently and say like oh like this this is a really cool trend that's going on or what are these yeah, other successful there, people doing and you need to be looking through magazines and looking at websites um, places like behance and other places where people are putting out work but it's also really important I, I do look at a lot of magazines we get magazines we look through them we tear them out um, we put a all the tear sheets in binders uh, for inspiration i will very often do a screen grab of something i think is cool because there's something about that image that will inspire me. I don't want to go and rip somebody off, right? but I do find inspiration in other things. It can be photography, it can be painting, it can be words. It, you know, inspiration comes from many different places, but it's really important to look at what other people are doing. They're your competitors, right? If you want to be in this market, if you want to be a beverage photographer, you need to be looking at the beverage ads that are out there. Find inspiration, find your own voice, and go out and make some images. And then... So, yeah, we definitely spend time in, during our downtime doing that. I do that all the time, whether I'm yeah. up or down, but... Um. <laughs> oh, we do too. And quite honestly, I'm much better when I'm busier. I get a lot more done okay. when I'm busier. The downtimes are hard when you've got time on your hands. I mean, it, it's great to get the studio organized. It's great to get the filing done. It's really important to have that downtime uh, and to work on portfolio images without question. I personally work better when there's more going on. It's so. more exciting. It's more exciting, and it gets me more focused. I can concentrate better when I have a bigger list of things to do. Right. You know. Right. That's. I. I think that I've experienced that as well, and I think many artists are the same way. It's like when when you're feeling like you're actually doing something, it's easier to feel like you can take on more, and you right. can you can be more productive with the right. time that you have. So, very cool. And the last question I have is, you know, uh, about your book in general is, um, in, in kind of seeing, you know, your work as a whole, mm -hmm. um, going from one image to another. How much of it do you see yourself in? I, I, it's, a, it's a weird question that, that I'm trying to figure out. Um, that's just not even a question, is it? <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to say? Um, it almost it seems like you're asking if I see myself in these images in some way. Yeah. Um, no, I see my style in these images. I see my approach. I see my production value, what I bring to the table in these images, and that I'm hitting a mark for a client. Um, is this a reflection of me, I think is what you're asking. And yeah, it is. I don't look at this and I don't, I don't see this as these images are me. Um, 
when I look at a total studio, that's what I think is a reflection of me. I mean, I, the images from the front to the back, what's on the walls, the furniture, the way I've laid this place out, this is my creativity. So I think I, I look at that as the whole, and, mm -hmm. and my studio is re really and truly a reflection of who I am as an artist. Um, in that sense, yes, the work is a reflection, but I don't look at that and go, ah, that's me, you know? Right, right. And um, it, that's a really interesting point because this is, um, this is your job, and mm -hmm. you take it very seriously, yeah. and, you, and you love these photos, but at the same time, you, it, it sounds like you are fully aware that this is your job. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, the, the word passion is, is one of the most overused words in the world, particularly when it comes to art. You know, I'm passionate about photography, so I want to do it. Um, but it is a job, and it is, this is commercial work. I am creating images for somebody else. They are contracting with me. They are paying me money to create images for them. Um, that's commerce, that's a business, I've got to execute something. And like I said before, it's not necessarily for me. Right. There's me in this, and there's my approach, my vision, my style, uh, but it's, at the end of the day, it doesn't belong to me. You know? <laughs> it doesn't, right? right. So, yeah, it's kind of weird. It it's is weird very talk. weird. Um, but it, it's also eye-opening, too, because there are, um, there are so many different avenues to take as a photographer. And that's you know, one thing I hope a lot of people are getting out of this, is that you know, you, you're an amazing product photographer. You are being commissioned to take these photos. I go a completely separate way with my photography. Other people go completely separate ways. Right. And it's, I just think it's eye-opening to see that you know, within the gamut of photography, you can make a profession in a million different ways. You can. There are so many different avenues in photography. Um, there are different styles of photography. There are different roles that you can play within a photo studio. Um, it, it's a really unusual business. And one of the reasons why it's so unusual is because it's rarely the same day twice. You know, you get to come in and you get to do different things from one day to the next and solve different problems for different clients. It's, you know, it's invigorating in that sense. I take great pride in what I do. I really love it. I'm very happy with the images I create, but I'm also um, very conscious about the production value. And, and I take pride in making sure that we create a really good, strong production flow for these images to come out to make the client happy. So it's, uh, you know, it's cool. It's not it's luck. No, 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 uh, no, no, no. <laughs> there are times when it's lucky, but, you know, I mean, there's that old quote about, you know, uh, luck is, was it, 75% um, preparation, 25% perspiration or something right, like that. You know, right, you've got, to, you've got to work into luck. You've got to be prepared so that if somebody does give you an opportunity because you happen to meet them somewhere, you know, one of my, my best friend met his biggest client in Disneyland Europe, changing their kids. They were just, they were just next to each other, changing their kid at a changing <laughs> table, struck up a conversation, and it became his biggest client. Wow. Th that could be luck, but at the same time, he was prepared to deliver the goods that that client needed. Good point. That wasn't luck. That meeting was, but delivering the product wasn't luck. It was preparation on his part. So. That's a really good point. Yeah. Cool. I think we'll end it there. All right. Rob, awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks, man. It's been awesome. Enjoy the talk. Love the book, by the way. Thank you. Appreciate that. And uh, thanks guys for watching. I hope you really enjoyed it. And uh, we're gonna show you some more great things from Rob Groom's studio. And uh, he's gonna show you guys a little bit about how he works. Look forward to that coming soon. Thanks guys, we'll learn you later.